Thanks. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. I want to wish a big Happy World Rhino Day uh, to everybody out there joining us. Today's a pretty special day where we learn about uh, the five rhino species found throughout uh, Asia uh, and Africa, and we also learn about the challenges that they're facing through poaching and habitat loss, uh, and we get to connect with amazing conservationists around the world who are rewilding habitat uh, as well as protecting these species and doing what needs to be done to save them from extinction. So it has been just a great morning so far. We started the morning in South Africa uh, and learned about Rhino 911, a great organization using helicopters for all kinds of things to bring anti-poaching units out into the field to rescue orphan rhino calves. We then spent a little time with the International Rhino Foundation with CC and uh, Enoff, who taught us about the Sumatran and Javan rhinos, who each of those species, their numbers are below 80, uh, which is pretty frightening, but it's not all bad news because both uh, of those species have programs going uh, and their numbers are slowly starting to tick up. Now, today's event, we have a very special event in store for you now. We're going to head into the field, live to the Toronto Zoo, and we're going to learn about two incredible species, the greater one-horned rhino and the white rhino. So this event is part of a three-organization partnership between us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, the Toronto Zoo, and Earth Rangers. So we'll learn a little bit more about uh, Earth Rangers and how students can continue their learning and take an active role in conservation uh, through their programs. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go live to the zoo. I'm going to pass things over to Angie and Desiree, who are joining us live with some special guests. So let's go. Let's bring them in. Hi, Hi Angie. Everyone. My name's Angie. My name's Desiree. And this happens to be our favorite day of the whole year because it is World Rhino Day. We love rhinos. Right now, we are at the Greater One Horned Rhino exhibit. And these are the rhinos that I work with. <laughs> And then in a bit, we're going to head to the white rhinos, and that's who Des works with. We've got two out here on exhibit today. We've got Mom, whose name is Asha, and we've got Kid here, whose name is Kieran. Now, Kieran is three and a half years old. Ash is 16 years old. There we go. And we also have a third rhino, a greater one horn. His name is Vishnu, and that's the dad. Um, these guys are actually a solitary species, though. So dad never gets to hang out with mom and kid unless it is for a breeding situation. And that's because he's very territorial. So he's kind of the big boss guy and we don't want any trouble. Now I heard that you've already talked to Inov in Indonesia. So I won't spend too much time speaking about the Javan rhinos and Sumatran rhinos, but the greater one horn rhinos are from India and Nepal. So they make up the three species or part of the three species that are from Southeast Asia. Now, all three Southeast Asian species are browsers. Javan rhinos and Sumatran rhinos only eat trees and bushes, but these guys not only eat trees and bushes, but they also eat grass as well. So they're considered a browser and a grazer. Now, it's super important when you're a browser to have this funny little lip right here. They love showing their lips. There you go. Now, this lip is called a semi-prehensile lip, and it actually acts just like a finger. See, so you can see that they actually can grab stuff with it, just like a horse does. Now, how that is important for a rhino is that if they're reaching up to get some trees or bushes, they're able to kind of get that bush using their lip, they can get it in their mouth, and then they can use the big strength of their head and neck to pull the entire branch down, and they eat the whole thing. <laughs> you like this, yeah. <laughs> Now, you may also notice while I'm feeding these guys, you'll notice that they've got two little teeth in the front of their mouth. Now, Kieran, because he's only three and a half, his are just little nubbins at the moment. <laughs> his moms are a bit bigger, average size for a female. But when Kieran is full grown and sexually mature, his teeth will be double the size of Ash's. And that's because this solitary species use these teeth to fight and defend themselves. They don't actually use their horns like the white rhinos and black rhinos in Africa. These guys gore each other basically with those teeth. And it's one of the reasons why people feel they have such armor looking skin. Now, no one knows exactly why these rhinos were designed with all these bumps and folds and flaps. I'll try to get you a good look. 
But the thought is, is that if you're actually being stabbed with something really sharp, it's handy to have a little extra protection in some important places. I know you're so good at showing your teeth. So all these extra flanges of skin around the rhino's neck here, that's gonna potentially help to protect their jugular vein. The flap that's over their shoulder is going to help to protect their heart and their lungs. And then there's one more flap over their hip and that's to protect their kidney and liver. Now again, no one knows for sure why they're designed that way, but it certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Now you may also notice that these guys have very big mouths. They've got very big nostrils, super big ears, and little wee eyeballs. Now basically that means their eyes are their worst sense because they're so small. So they have excellent sense of hearing and an excellent sense of smell. But they don't see very well, rhinos. And that's why they often get a bad rap for being aggressive. Uh, their thought process is that if something is coming at them, they're gonna turn, make themselves nice and big and stare right in the direction of what they think is the problem. Whoop, whoop. Hey, Mr. Pig. Now, these guys are called greater one-horned rhinos. And you can see they only have the one horn. Uh, the Javan rhino is very similar looking to these greater one-horned rhinos. So while there's only 75 Javan rhinos left, you're kind of getting a look at one right now. They're not identical to these two, but they are very, very similar. The Sumatran rhino looks different, the most different of all the rhino species. And they actually have two horns, just like the white rhinos and black rhinos, but their horns are smaller than Kieran's horn. They're just little bumps basically on the top of their uh, head. Now here at the Toronto Zoo, we're actually really lucky that we have two species of rhino. There are only five left. And rhinos have actually been on the planet for over 50 million years. So it's really important that we all do our part to help protect them. I hope you guys have got some fun things planned for your World Rhino Day events. Uh, one thing that we like to do is we like to raise awareness. So we want to make sure everyone knows how important it is that rhinos stay on the planet. There you go. So we've done a whole bunch of things. We fundraised for rhinos. Uh, all of our money goes to the International Rhino Foundation. And from there, they spread that money out throughout Africa and Southeast Asia to make sure all those species uh, get the help that they need. We also like to raise awareness by doing our Keeper Talks and these Facebook Lives to let everyone know all about rhinos so that they get to learn a little bit more about them and they start to get to like them and see how cute they really are, right? So hopefully you guys are uh, got some fun things planned or if not this year, definitely plan something for next year. You want to check out the International Rhino Foundation pages today. I'm sure you've learned all about those guys and everything that they're doing to help save those animals. And you also want to check out the Toronto Zoo. Uh, visit a local zoo is also another great way to help save rhinos as well. You can have your own fundraiser. Uh, you can also just be the champion for rhinos by communicating with your family and friends and letting them know that rhino horn does not cure cancer and only rhino horn should stay on a rhino. All right, guys, we're gonna take a quick trip and we're gonna head up to the white rhinos. We are zoo geographically designed. So the white rhinos, they live in Africa and the greater one horn rhinos, they're down here in the Southeast Asian section of our zoo. So we'll be right back. We are talking all things rhino today. And this video is covering a very important behavior that four of the remaining five species of rhino do participate in, and it's called browsing. The greater one-horned rhino, the Javan rhino, and the Sumatran rhino are all found in heavily dense jungle forests or woodland areas of Southeast Asia. The black rhino is found in habitats that consist of thick scrub, brushland, and woodland throughout various parts of Africa. The only rhino species that does not browse is the African white rhino, and they are a strict grazing species, which means they really only like to eat various types of grasses. The four browsing species of rhino all share a similar type of upper lip, called a semi-prehensile lip. 
This upper lip tapers to a point and the rhinos are able to use this lip just like a finger. This prehensile lip allows the rhinos to reach up to a tree or tall bush and they can grab at the branches by curling this lip around the leaves or branch tip and maneuver it into their mouth. Greater one-horned rhinos are the Southeast Asian species that live at the Toronto Zoo and are considered to be browsers and grazers. So they like to eat grasses, bushes, trees, and shrubs. Once a greater one-horned rhino has grabbed a branch, they then use the strength of their heads and neck to pull down the entire rest of the branch and eat the whole thing. We like to try to mimic how the greater one-horned rhinos would pull branches from trees when we offer brows. And to do this, we use the help of enrichment devices. By placing the brows or other tasty treats in devices, it requires the rhinos to use their body parts in a natural fashion to get at the food. Whether knocking the toys with their heads to dislodge the food, or using their strong lips to pull food off or out of the toys, the rhinos enjoy the challenge and occupation of foraging that their toys create. Each rhino species have their own unique way of breaking the branches they would like to eat. For instance, the Sumatran rhino prefers to grab a branch of a tree and twist it around and around and around the base of that tree until it breaks off. This unique way of eating allows the Indonesian rhino protection units to track these elusive rhinos in their very dense jungle habitat. With only 80 remaining on the island of Sumatra, which is about the size of California, the rhino protection units need all of the help they can get to track these rhinos, and they look for the telltale twisted remains of these branches. Unlike the African black rhino, the three Southeast Asian species of rhino basically live in a salad bowl. The jungle forests of Indonesia provide plenty of food for Sumatran and Javan rhinos, and they do not have to walk far to find tasty leaves. The greater one-horned rhinos are found in areas of Northeast India and Nepal that are full of grasses, trees, and shrubs, and they also love to eat aquatic plants. At the Toronto Zoo, we feed our greater one-horned rhinos as much grass as they would like to eat, but in the form of hay. We also provide them with browse, fresh in the summertime when our horticulture department trims our zoo trees, and as silage in the wintertime. Silage is the process of fermenting tree branches that can be stored for long periods of time under the correct conditions. Our nutrition staff spend summer days harvesting brows and fitting pieces into large plastic barrels. The sticks and leaves are compressed into barrels, forcing the air out, and then are sealed tight and left to ferment. This is an amazing treat for our rhinos in the winter, and also very important in maintaining both dental and overall health of our greater one-horned rhino family. Speaking of teeth, have you wondered how rhinos are able to eat brows? Check out all of the molars in the back of our rhino's mouth. They are able to chew branches that are up to five centimeters in diameter and sometimes even bigger. They just grind up the branch using all of their molars and swallow it down, which sounds something like this. So, on your next visit to the Toronto Zoo, be sure to look for our rhinos using their enrichment devices to get all of their tasty treats and brows. We are talking all things rhino today, and this video is covering a very important behavior that all five species of rhino do participate in, but it is the three Southeast Asian species of rhino, which are the greater one-horned or Indian rhino, the Sumatran rhino, and the Javan rhino that do it the most. The behavior is called wallowing. This is Vishnu, the Toronto Zoo's adult male greater one-horned rhino, and he is demonstrating how he likes to wallow in his natural muddy pool. All three Southeast Asian species live in heavily dense jungle forests and or woodland areas that are adjacent to a body of water, like a river, lake, or stream. It is hot and tropical in this location, and when you weigh anywhere from 2,000 to over 4,000 pounds and cannot swim, you need to find a way to cool down and get out of the heat. Wallowing is just the thing. Whether the rhinos are rolling in the mud or soaking in a river or lake, being wet is very important for these three species. As I mentioned, rhinos do not have the ability to sweat, which is how we humans are able to regulate our body temperature. 
so rhinos need an alternative way to relieve themselves of their body heat. Staying submerged in a cool lake or river not only helps the greater one-horned rhino to cool off, but also gives them some relief from biting bugs and even protection from getting a sunburn. These three species of rhino are considered to be semi-aquatic and have been known to swim very well. The Southeast Asian species of rhino are considered to be solitary, which means that for the most part, they would prefer to live by themselves. You can often find mothers and calves together, and occasionally, groups of unrelated females will congregate to feed or share in a water space peacefully. It is often the lone, territorial male who can spoil a relaxing water rest, especially if there are other adult males in the area. Wallowing provides the opportunity to rest, digest, cool down, and have some sun and bug relief. Rhinos are covered in a very thick layer of skin that is filled with tons of blood vessels and nerve endings, which means their skin is actually quite sensitive. Having all of those blood vessels at the surface of their skin is why biting flies are such pests to rhinos. The flies will start to chew on the rhino's skin and after very little effort, reach the blood they love to feed on. Being submerged reduces the area that the flies have to feed on, which is a momentary relief for rhinos. But what happens when you have to get out of the water to feed? That is where being covered in mud is helpful. The mud will cling to the rhinos as they exit the water, and as they start to dry, the mud hardens, giving the rhino an extra layer that the biting bugs will have to work a little harder to get through to their tender skin. It's important to make sure all skin surfaces are covered. Javan rhinos and Sumatran rhinos are considered to be the most critically endangered large mammals on the planet. With only 72 Javan rhinos and only 80 Sumatran rhinos, learning how these elusive species wallow has been a mystery until recently. Camera traps set out by the Rhino Protection Units of Indonesia have recorded some amazing wallowing footage. Javan rhinos are now only found in the Ujan Kulon National Forest on the island of Java. Javan rhinos not only have rivers to wallow in, they also have the Indian Ocean to swim in, as this Rhino Protection Unit discovered while monitoring the ocean side of the National Forest. It is amazing to see how easily this two-ton animal can escape into its jungle forest home and not be seen in just a few steps. Sumatran rhinos can be found in mountainous areas of Sumatra, where access to a body of water is not readily available. All five species of rhino do have the knowledge of how to dig their own wallows and are able to do so by using their strong forelimbs to pull the mud to the edges of the pit. Add a bit of tropical rain, and the rhinos are able to create their own muddy bath. Sumatran rhinos are unique in that they are covered in a coarse hair all over their bodies. Having that hair gives the mud something extra to stick to, giving these rhinos even more protection from pesky insects. The forested rhinos not only have biting flies to deal with, but also ticks and leeches, so good mud coverage is a must. This Sumatran rhino footage is not actually of a wild Sumatran rhino, but one who is housed at the Sumatran Rhino Sanctuary, a facility built in cooperation with the Indonesian governments and the International Rhino Foundation to help the dwindling Sumatran rhino population from going extinct. But what happens when you live in Canada in the winter time and can't use your muddy wallow because it's frozen? You lay under the mister, of course. Keeping our greater one-horned rhinos skin wet and their environment humid is very important for the health and well-being of our rhinos. Being able to provide different water sources for them to lay in is one way that we can keep the Toronto Zoo rhinos happy. As you can see, greater one-horned rhinos have an instinctive need to be in and around water. This is our latest greater one-horned rhino calf, Kieran, who in the video is only a few weeks old. Keepers wanted to give mom an opportunity to have a nice shower and were so surprised to see wallowing behaviors already present like getting right down and rolling on his side at just a few weeks of age. So, on your next visit to the Toronto Zoo, be sure to look out for our rhino in their favorite place, in their wallow. All right, so it looks like our amazing team at the Toronto Zoo are in place with the white rhinos. Let's bring Desiree in with us right now. Hi, Desiree. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for keeping with us on World Rhino Day. I'm so excited to share with you our white rhinos. 
So Angie's here with me as well. We're going to play off some of the things that Angie was talking about greater one horn rhinos. But first, I'll introduce you to our rhino that's on exhibit right now. His name is Theo. Theo is going to be turning four on December 24th. So he was almost, for us, a holiday baby. I was lucky enough with another keeper to be here the moment he was born. So he's a really special guy for me. Um, he was part of a naming contest. If you uh, are part of our Toronto Zoo mailing list, we like to sometimes hold naming contests for some of our animals. And uh, he was one of them. So it's Theodore. We call him Theo for short, but realistically, he's Theodorable. That's what his nickname is. Um, so he is approximately 3,500 pounds now in different than, so he's not full grown. Um, he'll be full grown around the age of seven to 10. So for white rhino males, that's approximately when they become mature. And I hope that he will live to be anywhere between 40 and 50 years old. So that would be a great age for a male white rhino. Now let's see if he comes back. Theo, Theo, come. Now you may have been able to see that his ears focused on my voice. So similar to what Angie said, these guys are almost identical to greater one horn rhinos in terms of their eyesight. They don't have very good eyesight. Their hearing is amazing. Uh, their smell is amazing. They need to smell a lot of cool things in order to decide if breeding is going to happen or not. Um, but those ears are like little satellites. Theo, good boy. Can you come? Can you come back here? I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to uh, beat out on the mud right now on exhibit. So similar to the video you just watched with greater one horn rhinos, these guys also wallow. It just happens to look very different. So these guys unfortunately can't lift their heads up as high as the browsing species of rhinos. They are the only species out of the five that has a great wide lip. So they think that that's how they partially got their name. They're not really supposed to be known as the white rhino, but they're actually supposed to be known as the wide-lipped rhino. So let's see if Theo comes over and you can see how much wider that is than the greater one horn rhinos you just met. And so usually what that means is we have a different lip structure. They eat different food items. Uh, what I love about these guys is they're known as the lawnmowers of the Africa savanna. So they would live in a nice open zone with lots of grasses. Um, and so you can see um, Theo right here He's eating something we've provided for him that is a grass that we feed, uh, basically it's hay. Now, what I love about these guys and teaching people about them is a lot of people think they're related to elephants and hippos, big gray mammals from Africa. Now they're actually close, more closely related to uh, their partner on exhibit over here, which would be the Grevy zebras. The girls might float by over there um, at some point. But these guys are very distantly related in the horse family. So we feed them somewhat similarly to horses, but keeping in mind um, that these guys have some sens sensitivities in their diet. So we have to watch out that some of their hay isn't super rich. They can pick up a lot of weight very fast. So we want these guys to be nice and trim. Now Theo, being a young growing boy, gets to have a little, he gets to be a chunky monkey. He's growing, he's got a lot more size to pick up. He's only about half the size of his dad. So we have a couple other rhinos here at the Toronto Zoo that you can visit. We have Tom, his dad, who's 14. We have Sabi and Zohari, our two females. Uh, they're back at the barn right now. Theo is uh, basically an independent little male, similar to what would happen to these guys in the wild. They are actually the most social out of all the rhino species, but males generally are more solitary and they would hold a territory and only be interested in the females when they are ready to um, be bred, so in an estrus cycle. So that usually only happens for this species around 28 to 37 days, depending on the female. So his mom, Zohari, was matched with Tom they came up here um, when they were three and a half years old as part of a species survival plan. So as Angie was mentioning about endangered species, these guys are the most numerous out of the five species of rhino. Uh, there are about 18,000 of these guys left. Um, but if you really think about it, for those of you guys that are joining us here from Toronto, that's almost the same number of seats in the Scotiabank arena. So all those, all white rhinos can fit into that arena if they were visiting us here in Toronto, which is a pretty, pretty sad picture that only 18,000 of them are left. Now, there are approximately only 28,000 
rhinos in total out of all five species. So these guys are at risk of becoming extinct. Many of you guys um, would know a lot about white rhinos because of the northern white rhino extinction. We have two northern white rhinos left on this planet living in Kenya. This is a different subspecies called the southern white rhino. So right now with those two females that are left on the planet, um, a lot of people read in the news about uh, the extinction of white rhinos. So this is a separate species, but it is actually possible that these guys will become extinct in our lifetime. They're poached at a rate of three animals every day. Uh, Angie was talking about rhino horns. Now you can see on Theo, he's got two small horns. Now when he gets bigger, yeah, they'll be quite massive. Uh, they weigh quite a lot and they people want the rhino horn as part of a traditional medicine. Now it is made up of tiny hairs that are compressed together and they grow from the top of their face. And it grows at a rate of about three inches every year unless they manicure it. So all of our rhinos get to choose how they manicure their horn. Um, and it is made up of a protein called keratin. So we all know about keratin. It's infused in shampoos to make our hair nice and strong. So their horn is made up of a protein um, and people want that for medicine. But scientists have proved that it actually has no medicinal value. So today on World Rhino Day, what's really important for us, and as Angie mentioned, we talk about the International Rhino Foundation as a conservation partner here at the Toronto Zoo. So you got to hear some um, people speak about the projects for the Asian rhinos. They also help save black and white rhinos from Africa. And what we want to do is help support their efforts in the wild and support our species survival plan here at the zoo. So what we would love for you guys to do is visit our zoo, come and visit both the whites and the greater one horn rhinos and notice the differences in their skin, their lips and their horns, and then also support our conservation partners like the International Rhino Foundation. So things you can do when you travel, you can make sure that you don't buy any product from any endangered species. Uh, you can also go on the International Rhino Foundation and buy their t-shirt today. Their big campaign, if you love social media, their hashtag is keep the five alive. Um, you can, they love to say that if you have $5, help keep the five alive, buy a t-shirt, go online and um, actually send a message. Come to the zoo, take a picture of our rhinos and tag it as Toronto Zoo and also keep the five alive and World Rhino Day. So spread the word that these guys should not go extinct. That's what we care about all on this day, but all days. Because if these guys should actually, like Angie said, they've been around for millions of years. It'd be really sad to see them go um, in, in our lifetime. So I'm going to end my talk there. I know that we're headed to another video and then we'll be back for some questions. Rhino Day everyone, from us here at the Toronto Zoo and your white rhino crash, our group of white rhinos. Here is a social group of white rhinos that you'll often see on our habitat. Theo in front with his tiny horns is only two and a half, but he's quite big as you can see. His mom Zohari and his auntie Sabi to the right. They are both 10 year old females. Now here in the next video are not actually white rhinos at the Toronto Zoo, but rather white rhinos found on Lewa Conservancy. Similar in age to Theo, this little one front and center, a young female is following her mom, doing a lot of grazing, so natural behavior exhibited by both our rhinos at the zoo and at Lewa. Now this next video is one of my favorites. It's of a male white rhino approaching two females to see if they are receptive to his breeding advances. At this point, they're telling him no. And I know that because I see these same behaviors with our white rhinos. So the two females on the right are facing him with their horns. They are showing that they're not quite receptive. They have relaxed tails, but very alert ears. And he's being quite a gentleman. He's not being aggressive at all. Now here Here's a video that we took to show you that we see some of the same behavior here at the Toronto Zoo. So it's Tom on exhibit with our two females, Sabi and Zohari. So this video was taken to show that these guys are showing Tom that they are the boss, even though he's the big male on exhibit at 4,000, sometimes 4,500 pounds. And they're trying to figure out who's the boss on exhibit. And he's trying to figure out whether or not any of the females are receptive for breeding. They are here as part of the species survival plan. And we're also highlighting Lewa Conservancy as one of our conservation partners. 
They are a 61,000 acre sanctuary held in trust in Kenya for the people. And it actually is home to many threatened species, not only white rhinos, but the other species of rhino you can find in Africa, the black rhino. Now, that little section there was the females telling Tom to back off, and that leads me into a beautiful video of black rhinos that are living on Lewa. So these two here are roaming, eating the grasses, they'll also eat the shrubs, different than our white rhinos, but uh, very similar to the greater one horn rhinos we have here at the zoo. They have a prehensile upper lip. They're considered a browsing species of rhinos. But unlike the greater one horn rhino, they too have two horns like our whites. So both African species have two horns similar to each other, just a different lip structure because they eat different food items. Black rhinos tend to be known as a much more aggressive aggressive species of rhino, often flipping safari trucks, uh, often going after people if they feel threatened. But here highlights how aggressive white rhinos and how protective white rhinos can be. As you can see, there is a zebra on the ground. Either it died of natural causes or it was that lion that caused its death, so that is sad. But those white rhinos are showing you that they're protective, that they're very um, careful, that they know that lions are a threat, but they also uh, don't feel as threatened from the lion based on the fact that they can show their horn and they can act really big and really tough and they can keep that lion away. It's very interesting that they're protecting the zebra right now. Obviously, they hang out quite a bit with lots of herd of zebra at Lewa. Lewa has um, 11 to 12% of the remaining Grevy zebra population, a very endangered uh, zebra species that we have here as well at the Toronto Zoo. So again, by saving the rhinos and by having them be our conservation partner, we have also saved many other species uh, that exist in the wild. Now this black rhino video is very neat. It highlights some of the birds that would live naturally in the same habitat on Lewa and also coexist with these species. They are known to warn rhinos when poachers are coming or any threats uh, by squawking and flying away rapidly so that does give the rhinos an advance notice that something's amiss. The other thing they do is they pick off little parasites that exist on their bodies. However, some research has recently come out that sometimes they do gouge the thick protective skin that rhinos have and they do cause openings. Um, now, that being said, rhinos have the ability to heal really well. Now, I'm going to end this video by showing you just how sweet our white rhinos are with those adorable wide lips. They are the only species that has a wide lip, and they are just as sweet as this video shows. They have the capacity to know their names, they're quite smart, and they can be super sensitive and super sweet. So it is unfortunate what's happening to them in the wild. They're being poached at a rate of one every 10 hours. Hours. Now we did see a decline this year so that's amazing news so although COVID has affected us all it did have a positive impact on a decline in poaching for the first part of this year. Now that some of our parks are opening we are gonna just have to see how that's impacted. Thank you so much for joining us here again at the Toronto Zoo. We all right well Desi and Angie thank you so much for uh, this amazing opportunity to see both the greater one horn rhino uh, and the white rhinos. And that last little video clip, we really got to see that difference between the lips from the prehensile lips of the browsers, the greater one horned, uh, to that wide grazing lip of the white horn rhino. Really cool. So we've got a great group of classrooms joining us. Many have already said hi in the chat. Uh, stretching from Toronto to Connecticut, all the way to California and all the way to India. So we've got a great group uh, of viewers tuning in with us right now, and we're gonna start working in some of their questions. So the first one I wanna start with uh, came from Mrs. Nielsen's group. Uh, and this is from Luca. And Luca wanted to know, how many teeth do rhinos have? Rhinos have between 24 and 28 teeth, depending on the species. So you guys would have seen the canines on the greater one horn rhino. So the species, usually the Asian ones that have the canines have more um, than these guys here that are more grazers. All right. And someone else from that same class, Ella. Ella has a very interesting question. She's thinking about 
physics and weight and things like that. And she's wondering if the rhinos can jump. Can a rhino jump? I can speak to white. Okay, I've yeah. seen I've seen the white jump all four feet off the ground. Now it's like this high. So they can, they can get a little bounce. Um, but this is the white. So we can't really say, we can't blanket statement all five species because they have a little bit different sort of physiology. So their heads are really heavy with these guys. They're a lot heavier in general. But yes, I've seen these guys jump. I can't say that I've seen the greater one horn rhinos jump. Um, but they certainly are very agile. Uh, there's, you know, all these boulders and rocks and stuff that are in the exhibit. You'll see them climbing up on top of those. Um, and then they become very tall all of a sudden. Uh, and that's good physical exercise for them technically. But I don't know that I've just seen them kind of spring. What I have seen them do is run very fast. And when they get galloping, all four feet are off the ground. Just like as if a horse was running super fast, the rhinos do the same thing. So they'll get going really, really fast. And all of a sudden there's a moment where there's nothing touching the ground. Good wow, point. that's awesome. Uh, thanks for those great questions to get us started. We're gonna go to another group here. Uh, Miss Eccles class is joining us and they were wondering, uh, we saw that the greater uh, one horn rhinos were very happily munching away. They're wondering what they were eating and then how much they have to be fed in a day. Great questions. Um, so basically uh, the diets are a little bit similar in that we feed the greater one horn rhinos hay as well. Um, that's the grazing part of their diet. So we give them as much hay as they want to eat. Every time they finish their pile on the ground or what's in the hay rack, I give them some more. Um, what I was feeding them though, is their training or treat part of their day. And, uh, the greater one horns are a little different than the white rhinos in that they actually love to eat a lot of, uh, varied produce items. So today I fed apples, bananas, some melon. Uh, what else do I have in there? We also feed romaine lettuce, and uh, carrots. They love carrots. So that's kind of their treat portion of the day. Um, and then we also try to supplement them with browse, which we talked about in one of those videos. So as often as we can get trees and plants and bushes from our horticulture department, we love to give it to them and they love to eat it. All right. Excellent. Well, we saw that great video of the greater one horn rhino calf, just loving yeah. uh, that water, loving getting, uh, wet there. And so we have a classroom who would love to know why is it so important, uh, that they, they stay wet like that. So there's a couple of different reasons why it's super important for greater one horn rhinos to stay wet. Um, one reason uh, is to keep them cool or to warm up technically. Um, rhinos can't sweat like we do. So they actually kind of have to use their environment to help keep them warm or cool them down. So on a hot summer day, those rhinos will be in the wallow all day. About 70% of the day will be just resting in the pool, keeping nice and cool. Being in the pool also helps to keep flies off of them. And those flies that we have in the summertime, they start biting and it really hurts. They bite us as well. Um, so being in the water, they can't bite you if you're underwater. Uh, our water also has a lot of clay in it, so they can roll around in the clay and mud. So if they do need to come up out of the water, they have a good coating on top of them. That helps also to keep them cool, helps for some sun protection from like a sunscreen. And again, to help with those biting flies. If you've got to chew through all that mud first before you get to their skin, uh, it's really rather handy. So they just have an instinctual desire to be wet and be in the water. The greater one horns being grazers as well, they actually eat a lot of aquatic plant material. So it kind of kills two birds with one stone. They can head into the lake to cool down and also just munch on all the vegetation in there as well. Okay, we've got great questions coming in. Lots of great questions. This is from Miss Anthony's class. And in both the video and live with the greater one horn rhinos, we got a really close look uh, at those mouths. So they're wondering, is there any care you have to do like brushing their teeth? Well, that's a great question. Um, we are learning a lot more about their teeth. The more that we work with them and the more uh, that zookeepers get together and share their knowledge, which we do at a, at a conference every couple of years. And teeth care is actually becoming a really big thing. One of the problems that we have here at the zoo is um, we do also feed one other part of their diet, I forgot to tell you, is called a herbivore cube. And it's basically like a little cookie for them. And that is to supplement the hay. So hay is dead grass. And when grass dies, it loses all of its yummy vitamins and, and minerals that are really important for the health of the rhinos. So we wanna make sure that they get that every day. And we, um, our zoo has made up these cubes that has 
It's made of hay, but also has all of the extra vitamins and minerals that are in it. However, those cubes, it doesn't take much to break them apart. So when the rhinos are chewing them, a lot of it is staying stuck to their teeth. And we're starting to notice that that's actually causing some gingivitis and tartar buildup. Um, so it is really important that we are trying to take a look inside their mouths, some way to brush their teeth, which is tricky because they have a lot of lip. <laughs> so trying to get in back in those cheeks, uh, their teeth are also really huge. So you certainly don't want your fingers <laughs> stuck in there either. Um, so we are trying to come up with a lot of zookeepers at different zoos are trying to come up with different ways as to how to help um, be on top of any dental issues. So rinsing their mouth out with a hose is one thing that we're looking at training, using a toothbrush. Uh, you saw Ash, uh, Asha was really good at opening her mouth, um, which is great. I get a good look inside. I, I haven't tried to stick anything in there yet, but hopefully one day she'll let me and we're working on that. Great question. All right. Well, that would be a great live stream, I think. Toothbrushing at the Toronto Zoo <laughs> would be pretty cool. We'll keep you in mind. Uh, yeah. Okay, good stuff. So uh, Johannes is joining us and has a great question here about rhinos recognizing each other. Do they recognize each other? How do they recognize each other? Uh, well, I'll speak to the social species of rhinos because recognition would mean that they sort of understand that they're affiliated somehow. But we, we were just talking about this earlier is that all of our rhinos do have a set of vocalizations and they're quite different depending on sort of the purpose behind them. So Theo, when he came out here, I was calling him to come to this spot right before we went live and he called back to me. So they do understand people that sort of hang out with them and they do the same call to each other. So his mom is in the barn. When he goes back in the barn, he'll make a specific call, which is what scientists have actually labeled a location call. So it's like, if I put this noise out there, who's going to call back and who do they mean to me? But what's interesting is they can communicate vocally, but for both of our species, another big way that they communicate is actually through their feces, which is their poop. So these guys will poop in an area and rhinos will go and they'll actually all smell it. Sometimes they'll even taste it and that sounds disgusting, but it's really important for them to actually assess sort of who it is. Is it a threatening male? Is it a female that's coming into an estrus so she wants to be bred? Maybe I should follow her if I'm a boy. So there's lots of ways that rhino communicate that aren't even just vocalizations. But yes, you can actually go online and you can look up, you literally look up rhino vocalizations. There's a great question here and I'm glad it's come up and it's uh, what can students do? Obviously, you know, here in Ontario, the United States, we're pretty far away uh, from rhinos, but how can we help out? How can we play a role in conservation? So one of the easiest things that every single person can do is to keep talking about rhinos and tell your family, tell your friends, tell your neighbors about the things that you learned here today. The biggest problem facing rhinos is that they're being killed and they're being killed because of a myth, basically. Um, Traditional Southeast Asian medicine uh, has made claims that rhino horn will cure cancer, a cold, a hangover, now all COVID, COVID, all kinds of things. And it's not true. Um, science has proven it. It is only made of keratin, rhino horn, and uh, that's the same protein as our hair and fingernails. So if that cures cancer, we could all just chew our own hair or our own fingernails and no one would have cancer anymore. So it doesn't work. Unfortunately, because these myths are in play, um, it is illegal to kill a rhino for its horn. It's illegal to own the horn and it's illegal to sell it. So all this stuff is done underground, secret. Um, and because of that, it's a lot of money <laughs> cost to get a kilogram of rhino horn. So the people that are killing them are becoming rich. The people that are buying it, especially if it's to cure cancer, it's not curing their cancer. And it's actually a real shame. Um, so. We need everyone to know that rhino horn will not cure cancer, won't cure anything. Um, so we need to leave them alone. We need to leave the horns on the rhinos. And that's the biggest thing. Um, and keeping talk about rhinos alive. There's not a lot of media that covers rhinos. So you guys telling your family and friends the cool things that you learned here today or doing your own research is one of the easiest things that you can do to help save rhinos. If you want to go a little further, however, uh, we love that and we want you to raise some money to help rhinos. Um, one of the biggest problems is that these big people that are killing the rhinos, they have a lot of money behind them. And when they go to Africa, which is the rhinos that are usually hunted because they've got two horns and they're giant. So you're making a lot of money, not like those little horns and the greater one horn rhino. 
Um, so the, the poachers are going to make a lot of money. Where rhinos live is very vast and very huge. And even though the governments in Africa are trying very hard to um, have rangers be on patrol to look out for poachers, they can't be everywhere at once. Um, the landscape is just too big. Uh, and I've totally lost my train of thought of where I was going with that. <laughs> By fundraising. Fundraising, yeah. thank you. Oh my gosh, yes. So uh, the more money we can raise and that we can get over to Africa, we can give them more tools to help protect the rhinos. One of the best things that has happened lately in the past number of years are dogs, if you can imagine. We are getting anti-poaching dogs in the field with rangers who are the handlers. And these dogs with their endurance, their sense of smell, they can detect guns, they can detect gunpowder, they can detect the smell of a bullet or the smell of some other human that isn't mm -hmm. their handler. And they're gonna track these people. And that's how these, um, and these poachers are getting caught is is by uh, the dogs but the dogs take cost a lot of money they need to be trained they need to be fed they need vet care they need housing they need shelter all that stuff so fundraising for rhinos really helps to save them in so many different ways i'll add that another thing you can do when you all feel comfortable is actually go and travel to these countries find a responsible conservancy or reserve that houses rhinos and go visit them as a tourist giving tourist dollars to places that save these guys and protect their habitat will also make sure that they become extremely valuable to those countries. So the countries that actually value these animals um, as an income source also have something, they just really need to save them then because that's what gives people jobs, that's what keeps people from um, being able to afford medical. So these guys, it's really important to save them as a very valuable tourist resource in their native countries. And then um, Angie touched on fundraising, which is a big one for both of us. But the other thing you can do, we talked about the International Rhino Foundation. So I challenge you all right now in your classrooms after this is over, is go to the International Rhino Foundation website. They actually have a what you can do. So keep the five alive. They have five things that you guys all can do within your classrooms, but as an individual as well. So because they are the best organization for saving all five species, Go there and do one of those five things. All right, excellent. <clears throat> Up there right now. And also, you know, we get the question a lot is what, what can we do as classrooms after thing, uh, an event wraps up? And we mentioned that this event today is in partnership with uh, another great organization called Earth Rangers. So I'm gonna pop that uh, site up right here for you to check out afterwards with your classroom and earth rangers is where kids can go to help save animals so they have a beautiful new uh app i spent some time on the website today and got lost in all the great videos and animal facts and things you can explore on the website and there's also uh, a neat little special offer today so i want to share a quick little video to introduce you to earth rangers and the brand new app uh, that kids can explore This is Kyla from Earth Rangers, and we are the Kids Conservation Organization. We work with thousands of kids across Canada to help protect our planet and the incredible animals that call it home. Now, I hear you love animals, and that's why I want to talk to you about the Earth Rangers app. But before we do that, I have a special guest with me that I want you to meet. This is Millie, the three-banded armadillo. Now, I'm going to put Millie down so you can see her up close and personal as she runs around. Do you see how she walks on her tippy toes? It might look unusual, but it certainly doesn't slow her down. These pointed toes actually come in handy when she needs to dig through the dirt or break apart tree bark to catch insects. She's also got a really long sticky tongue that she can use to slurp up hundreds of ants and termites from their mouths. Now, armadillos are famous for their ability to curl up into a ball. It offers them the ultimate protection from their predators. By curling up, Millie's face, belly, and legs are all hidden and protected from danger by her armor, which are these bony plates covered in super tough skin made from keratin, the same material that your nails are made out of. So good luck getting through that. But 
No matter how prepared armadillos like Millie are to defend against predators, there are other dangers that her armor won't protect her from in the wild. Threats like habitat loss and climate change are making life difficult for lots of animals in the wild, and they need our help. And that's exactly where you come in as an Earth Ranger and an animal saving hero. Right now is the best time to get involved. As an Earth Ranger, you can support important conservation work for animals right here in Canada, like river otters in the Saskatchewan River Delta and grizzly bears in Canada's north. You can also do things like our missions, where you can get involved to make a difference in your own community. There's over 20 different missions to choose from, like Live Love Local, where we challenge you to shrink your carbon footprint by eating food grown locally, or H2O Harvester, where you can make a rain barrel to collect rainwater to help prevent harmful runoff from polluting local waterways. Just download the Earth Rangers app and become an official Earth Ranger member. You'll also have access to things like the Earth Rangers podcast, daily fun trivia questions, Wildwire blog, and so much more. But it gets even better. You'll earn points for everything you do as an Earth Ranger, and as you level up, new habitats, animals, and bonus items for your avatar will get unlocked. Now, Millie and I have a special gift for you. If you use the code Millie in the Earth Rangers app, you'll get 25 bonus points to start you on your animal saving journey. That's Millie, M I L L I E. Don't forget to write that down. And remember, when you get home, don't forget to download the free Earth Rangers app to start saving animals today. Bye, everyone. All right, very cool. So do head over to Earth Rangers, uh, check out that exciting brand new app. Don't forget to use that code Millie to get your 25 points to start and immerse yourself in a world of conservation, missions, learning. It's a lot of fun. So I definitely hope uh, our students check this out after the live event. Let's bring Angie and Desi back in here. Maybe Theo's still back there somewhere in the background. He's wallowing. Yeah, having a wallow, excellent. Perfect thing to do on a rainy day. Let's squeeze in another question or two and then we'll let you guys go get dry because I know, uh, yeah, it's a rainy day here in Southern Ontario. Um, all right, speed. How fast are the rhinos? How fast can they go when they get moving? Another great question. Um, you wouldn't think a 4,000 pound animal could move very quickly, but honestly, when they are running, they are running. Uh, rhinos can actually get up to speeds of about 40 kilometers an hour. Now, they cannot maintain that speed um, because of their weight. It's really a quick rush and then go. But they can get up to that fast. And it's actually one of the big reasons that we don't go in with our rhinos. Um, not only their eyesight is not very good, but they can move very quickly and they can turn on a dime. So they can be headed this direction and next thing you know, they're going that way. So we would hate to be in the middle of the paddock raking away and all of a sudden something scares them and they start charging. Well, they may not see us, so they could totally run us over. So we don't go in with our rhinos to be safe because they're so big and they don't see well and they move very quickly, except for the babies. We go in with the babies. Yeah, well. <laughs> They're not so fast. Become a rhino zookeeper, everybody. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to get you inside. So one more question here from Emmanuel in Miss Lewis's cal class in California. How much does a full-grown rhino weigh? So how does it, the white rhino and the greater one-horn rhino compare? So there's a bit of discrepancies. Uh, who thinks which rhino species weighs more? Competition. Uh, I do have to concede, I imagine it is probably the white rhinos because they have those two massive horns on their, on their face. Their skulls are so big that that adds a lot of extra weight. Um, height wise, I think the greater one horns are definitely taller animals, but uh, the greater one horn rhino males max out at about 4,500 pounds, females at about 4,000 pounds, and the white rhinos, so, uh, uh, basically it's the same. Um, it just depends on each male. It's, it's almost identical, but like Andy said, basically greater one horn rhinos are rhinos on stilts. It's mostly height. These guys are mostly mass. All right, well, the skies have opened up. I want to say a huge shout out to all of our classrooms who joined us uh, live via YouTube and Facebook today. Thank you for the amazing questions and being with us on World Rhino Day. A huge shout out to Mary Ellen, who I know is uh, behind the scenes with the camera. Uh, and then Desi and Angie, thank you so much for getting out there, getting wet for us today. 
uh, in the weather and, uh, you know, just bringing these beautiful charismatic animals live into classrooms everywhere. We're happy to do it. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Happy World okay. Day. Thank you so much. Go get dry. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Take care.